And it's easy to grab my Bible and just read this and insert my culture right into it and then not really have any grid for what it's talking about. So what do I do? I look around at my culture and see what's close and then I allow the times to interpret scripture rather than scripture to interpret the times. And we do that from generation to generation. The church has misunderstood this for a long time. The further it got away from its Hebraic roots, the further it got away from the early church fathers. It's not like God was abandoning us or leaving us on our own. It's just the church got really institutional. Then we needed a reformation. We needed a change. Uh, but just piggybacking that change at the reformation came the age of logic and reason. So that you see the supernatural expression die down somewhat, even though the great awakenings were going on. And then people were trying to figure out after the mess of the Reformation, like how do we know that we know God? So they came up with transactional language because the people leading the movement were all lawyers, all right? And so they were very much in 1500 product of their time. And so the way we get the Bible translated from then on, the way we understand God from then on, is very much a product of, transa of transaction instead of relationship, right? But the whole time, Paralleling that, you always have people who are connected to God, who know God, who are maintaining and steward that, stewarding that relationship. And so, as you'll see in the big meta narrative or storyline of the Bible, we're here and God's been making a way for us to study and understand what Scripture's talking about. Sound good? Yes. Now, in this lesson, I'll pull, pull a few things out I want to kind of look at. I'm going to write down. For you, what he has written down on his board right here. <laughs> and we start with creation. <laughs> Right? And that yields to what? A new creation. <clears throat> What's underneath it? Fall. Israel. Jesus in the kingdom. So creation falls. Adam. So, G so the Lord, after the fall, has to form, call a man through which he would form a nation through which the Messiah would come. Right? So man, nation, Messiah, transformation, recreation. Man, nation, transformation, recreation. Right? And so he chooses Israel as the people through which he would begin to separate Yahweh from all of the other surrounding gods. Right? And you learned about that in the book. The idea of some of the crazy sounding laws in Leviticus was about the identification and demarcation of Israel apart from Egypt and Canaan and the other gods that were part of this cosmology or much bigger picture that was going on. We're going to examine a course next semester called the spiritual realm. And we're going to look at all the different beings in the spiritual realm. Did you know the spiritual realm has more than angels and demons? Elohim, Seraphim, Uds, Oracles. There's all different types of words for beings in the spiritual realm in Hebrew. It's, it's, it's hard to translate that stuff to a culture who doesn't understand it. So they just pick the word spirit for each different category and then translate all these things into spirit in English. In, in Greek, who knows what the word agape means? Love. Love. That's one of seven different words in the Bible for love. But each time we see the word love, it matches each one of those different translations. So it's a lot more descriptive, right? So creation, fall, Israel, right? And you have Jesus and his kingdom. Now I said this in one of the videos, but I'm going to say it again. If Jesus is standing... He is in, he's in me. 
and it's like the it's like the caramel inside the kiss. Right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you, Jesus. Okay, I'm back, but not really. I'm half gone. If Jesus is standing right in our midst, and He's the King, then where's the center of the kingdom? It's wherever the King is at. It's not way off, fancy, heavenly place. The King is on the ground in the land. It's His land, and He's there. He's ruling and reigning. Right? So when Jesus shows up on the earth, the kingdom is here. It's present. So two things are happening simultaneously when Jesus is here. The old age or era is concluding. And the new age and era is beginning. Right? You had a good start. You had a fall. Oopsies. Right? So the gap, and this is how we view God, is through the gap, right? So what did Jesus do to restore that gap? He pulled it back together. See that? He took the old and the new. He fulfilled one, and not really the new. So that's one part of it. That's not the point I'm making, though. I start drawing and get inspired. <laughs> <laughs> when he's on the earth some people are like oh you know the words of Jesus are Old Testament no the words of Jesus are New Testament no they're Old Testament because he hadn't shed his blood yet so we don't have to listen to anything Jesus said that's not true right what you gotta recognize and understand is that Jesus was doing two things at once he was landing one era and beginning a second era so when he's speaking to us he's, he's it, it has a dual intention the whole time. He's ending the Old Testament, the old era. It's the last days of that era. And he's beginning the new era. The word in times in scripture, um, if you translate it correctly, it means new age. Mm. Well, that sounds crazy and freaky. Are you talking about modern new age? No, this precedes it all. I'm talking about the new Jesus era or epic, E-P-O-C-H, epic season, right? So he's landing one season and beginning another. So language that he uses that might sound judgmental or bad or stuff like that is telling everyone who's still participating with this timeline, not timeline, with this way of thinking, that this way of thinking is about to end. And if you keep participating with this system, you're going to participate with the final closure of that system. Right? However, if you hear the words that I'm speaking, it's like a house built on solid ground. And then you'll be able to build on that and move on. Right? So what does he say as he's weeping over Jerusalem? Right? Matthew 24, Luke 21. Everyone reads those as if they're in time passages. They're not. It's written to Israel in that moment in time because um, Titus was going to come sack Jerusalem, which he did in 70 AD. And it was devastating. Right? And how many Christians were in the city when it got sacked? Zero. They read um, they read Jesus' words and they read John's letter from Revelation and they got out of town. Right? One taken behind and one left. So what they would do in that time is the Romans would show up and they would take one person out of the house and take them to be tortured, crucified, or killed and leave the others behind so the ones who were left behind would think twice before they rebelled. Had nothing to do with a near recent in times fiction series. That's why most of those books you can find them for sale for 50 cents. But I'm not slamming it. I wouldn't say anything controversial, but I just can't get my foot out of my mouth. <laughs> I think I was probably the same state point that I was the only person that read any of those, and I read one book not understanding any of the context. Yeah. Yes, Alicia. I read them. Alicia read them all. Oh, dang. Alicia was yeah. well versed. She used to look at me in the car like, what are you yeah, doing? Watched, uh, <laughs> What's happening? Yeah. Yeah. Right? 
And so my mission here isn't to undo stuff. My mission is to teach Bible. And sometimes when we teach Bible, things that we believe in our current system, we realize. And we'll get into that in a second when we, there's a really great example in here. Now, again, I love people, right? And so our heart goes out to them. And we don't walk around, we don't weaponize this and walk around like we know everything. We call people heretics, right? We don't call people out, we call people up. Right. I want to build bridges, I want to build on ramps for people. And if I start with love, I'm in a pretty safe space. Yeah. Right? Sure. So in this big story, this meta narrative, right? So this is the cosmology, right? It's like you said, you guys watched the video, correct? Right? And so in in the in the book, How to Read About for All It's Worth, this is the meta narrative. Because God's massive unfolding plan is Jesus himself, right? And so the layer below that is all of scripture points to Jesus. It's Jesus and his story. Boom, redemption, boom. And the book that you're reading breaks this part up into six acts, right? And then down below it, you have the individual stories. All right, there's thousands of them, right? And it's, it's all part of this thing called this epic narrative. And what illustration did he use to compare epic narrative to? Lord of the Rings. Yes, great answer, right? And so you can read one part of Lord of the Rings and then take that out without reading the rest of it. And maybe you think that Gollum's the hero. Because he presents himself as hero in some of the dialogue. And you might be rooting for this guy, and it might take you, if you've already made that decision, it might take you like two of the three books to realize, oh, wait a minute, he's actually the ultimate villain, and he's actually the metaphor or embodiment of the old man, new man. Right? And so, meta narrative, the Jesus narrative, and then the individual stories. So, what a lot of people do is they'll take one of these and say, oh, that looks like maybe this, right? And this looks similar, right? And they'll put this all together, and they'll create something that doesn't line up with the meta-narrative called, I don't know, preacher of rapture theory? I don't know, something like that? And, and then they say, no, Scripture says this. And so what they try to do is they try to insert stuff from these stories into the rest of the meta-narrative. But they're still not looking at the thing as a whole. Jesus died to give us a new humanity so the end would look like a beginning. He wouldn't take the most, most important player of the church out right at the last second before all things conclude. Because it's not about judgment, it's about recreation. The judgment factor happened right here. The white throne is the cross, seen, one seen from earth and one is seen from heaven. Right? You're seeing things from different perspectives and layers because remember, um, oh, we haven't even gotten here yet. In How Not to Read the Bible, I don't think you've gotten here yet. We read the first six days of creation, and what do we think? We think it's about six days of creation, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? And so we kind of go through this thing where it's one, two, three, four, five, six. This is actually forming on days one, two, and three, and then filling on days four, five, and six. So on day one, he creates the heaven and the earth, and on, on day four, he fills it with the sun, moon, and stars. All right? Somebody, staff, find, there's a graph on one of the pages that shows this, try to find that. On day two, he forms the, um, the sky and the dry land, and on day five, I'm sorry, he forms the, um, the sky and the sea. So on day five, he fills up with the birds of the air and the fish of the sea. Right? On day three, he forms the dry land. And on day six, he fills it with animals and people. So it's forming and filling, not one, two, three, four, five, six. Does that make sense? Yes. You're formed and filled with the spirit. This is the pattern of creation. If we zoom in one step further, you guys haven't seen me make my snow angel yet, have you? Oh, man. Or sand angel. I mean, we are down the beach. Who's ever made a stone angel? Did I already talk about this on the video? No. So I make a stone angel. I get down in here, right? 
I stand back up. What's left in the snow? I didn't see it. An imprint. An imprint of what? You. Of my form. So I just formed something. Right? So in Genesis, when he says, let, let us make man in our image, the word image is also the word imprint. What does the father do? He imprints himself into the earth. He leans down and he fills it with his pet or his spirit or the substance of himself. So what happens? Adam. Adam's inhale was Yahweh's exhale. He formed him with his imprint and his image and then he filled that imprint with his breath. What does Jesus do in the new covenant? He reforms his church and then what does he fill us with? The Holy Spirit. He says, don't go to the ends of the earth yet. Wait until you see power from on high. Why? You've been formed, but you haven't yet been filled. As soon as they were filled, it clicked. Peter, who was hiding away, afraid for his life, stood up with the eleven and declared. The wrong person standing there could have killed him immediately. Forming and filling. So this happens at the beginning because it happens in the middle and it's everything that we're working towards at the end, which brings us back to the beginning, the meta narrative of the Bible. Sound good? Yes. Nope. Good try. <laughs> I think it's the beginning of the science chapter. So wherever he talks about science, well, if they find it, we'll just tell you what page it's on. They can cast the graph from one, two, three, four, five, six. Sound good? Yes. All right. What am I supposed to be done? I'm already on over. It's the one I showed it. No, I've got I've got twenty eight minutes left. I can do this. Yes. Everybody say, Dave. Yay. You got this. You can do it. You can do it. You, can do it. you, you cannot it squirrel. Here it is, page one ninety one. Thank you. One ninety one. Page one ninety one. Oh, good. Yeah. Oh, good. It's part four. Jesus oh, you want the Excel looking spreadsheet? Okay. Yeah. Yep. There you have it. Well, cool. All right. Some highlights from the video. It's a library from the other side. Okay, he's talking about the Bible, and he's like, hey, a lot of people are taught to read the Bible as A, a divine behavior manual. Who's ever read it like that? Mm -hmm. yes. Me. B, a devotional grab bag. <laughs> What's up? Surprise. Yeah. Stop it. <laughs> Hi. Surprise. 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 Sorry, I'm late. I had a whole thing. No, no worries. <laughs> so most people are taught the Bible study looks like you get your Bible study and you get your Bible out. You read a couple of verses. You highlight and think about how that applies. And, hey, that's fine. That's called devotions. We should do devotions, right? But that's different than Bible study, right? What is Bible study? It's reading the Bible in its literary, cultural, and historical context, right? And it's seeing the big picture, right? Big picture, minutes and narrative, individual stories, how Jesus ties everything together. It's all in the middle, right? The, Hebrew, the Hebraic concept of time is in a straight line. It spirals upwards and expands. You have an event happen here, it's going to happen again, but it's going to be bigger. It's going to happen again, but it's going to be bigger, right? Creation, restoration, oh, new creation is even bigger than his original plan because he only accelerates and expands as he goes, right? So if I have the meta narrative, I have how Jesus holds things all together and I have the, the little stories, it's the hermeneutic circle that you guys heard me talk about. It's the forest and the trees and the dance that they do as, as, as we work together to see the whole thing. It's one unified story. It's all about Jesus. 
And again, I want to read this comment that he made. It's a library from the other side of the planet written a, th a thousand years ago. Here, understand this document. Just read it. Just read it. It's been tra translated into your language from a different culture. But just read it and God will speak to you and, and you'll know what it says. All right? On the one hand, yes, that's true. But don't start them in Leviticus. Start them in the Gospel of John. That's why I start people. Yeah. And then from there, I'll let people know, hey, this was written in a different culture. Here's some tools that are going to help you understand this. And get around, get around a group of people who understand uh, the context of the Bible. And that's really going to help you grow, right? And he says, our pre-programmed assumptions short-circuit how we read the Bible. Again, I got a good metaphor coming in a second for what that looks like in the book. Dun, dun, dun. And he does another good thing, kind of encapping the, the creation and the new creation. In the beginning, sets the tone. What sets the tone for the end? And they shall reign forever and ever. You see, Father, Son, and Spirit with a desire to procreate. You see that procreation, the full reaction as they reign forever and ever. A well-known person in Christianity says this. I don't think we just sit around clouds when we die. I think we're going to go from planet to planet evangelizing the universe. Who do you think said that? Mm. Billy Graham. I know you're waiting for you're waiting for you know the charismatic guru answer, right? So it shows you that the God is speaking the reality of His Word and what it really means, not just to a niche group of people. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you can go study at Oxford in England; they're going to give you this approach, right? It's not going to be this narrow. American gospel. A lot of people say American gospel all about prosperity. Well, actually, if you look at the gospel, it's all about cultural transformation. So be prosperous so you can transform the planet. Yeah. The orphan spirit wants to attack Christians for having money, mm -hmm. and then they're not able to help the person in poverty. Mm -hmm. Or someone who needs to transition from a lifestyle where they're struggling to a lifestyle where they're thriving. Mm -hmm. But because people are prosperous things like be generous are in play and being generous can partner with soar and we can see god do amazing stuff yeah. right so god's not anti-money he's anti-money becoming your god yeah, yeah. yes that's good. Oh, that was good that was good, <laughs> that was good. <laughs> david edwards <laughs> god's not anti-money <laughs> That's going to be a, a you mean later. Is anti-money becoming your God? <laughs> <laughs> Sit it. down. I'm done. Right. <laughs> no. We went through two microphones because me and Stephanie really? at one Drop. point just both dropped the mics and we thought we were cool and then the mic didn't work. We're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> now we do, need to do a metaphorical mic drop, not a literal one. <laughs> All right, I think I jumped ahead and said most of this already. All right, so I'm, I'm going to jump into how not to read the Bible. We'll burn through this pretty quick. Did you guys watch the intro? Yeah. From the yes. slightly punk rock author, Dan Kimball? Yes. <laughs> this book is way easier to read. It is, isn't it? Yeah, I feel a little smarter. There you go. There you go. Then I do read the last one. You're reading it, but as you're reading it, are you pinging off things that you read in the previous book? Yeah, I feel like I have to say yes. <laughs> but it's so literal. Like, I really had a hard time. And that's my second time reading it. Hey, I've read it many times, and I still, I read it this past time, and I saw something I've never seen before in it. And I'm like, oh, that makes sense. Wow. No, you're doing good. How not to read the Bible. I've actually told other people already they should read this book. Yeah. yeah. It's one of my favorites. It's good, yeah. But here's the thing, too. The other book is such a staple in, in theology and seminaries 
a lot of times that's going to be people's answer to anything you present. Well, have you read how they read the Bible for all its worth? Yes. You have twice. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Of course yes, I have. The other one yes. Has yes. Stories, so it's yeah. This be one's got cool pictures on the front. Becoming an atheist by reading the Bible. <laughs> Slavery and magical underwear. Why is it okay for God to kill children like Herod did? Why doesn't God like women? Right? And so he, he goes through this whole story in the intro of setting up the premise for the book and the different uh, parts of the book that we're going to go into, right? And so he addresses a few things like, okay, well, why, why was it okay for God to kill all the firstborn in Egypt? Why was it okay? Well, that's how people read it. Well, if God is good, well, then why is God killing babies and all the firstborn in Egypt? What if the Exodus story was God's attempt to save Egypt from their false gods and to come out of slavery? What if the Exodus out of slavery wasn't just for the Israelites, but it was also for the Egyptians to come out of slavery to their gods? What if that's why the judgments were not were a lot less severe at the beginning and the time was so prolonged? And what if that's why he kept hardening Pharaoh's heart? Because he was attempting to save a nation. Yeah, that's good. We usually read it from the other way around. Well, God's just killing all these babies. And, and if we subscribe to some of the things, some of the sacred cows that we've already gotten rid of in here. Oh, yeah, they deserve it. They deserve every bit of that judgment because, well, because why? Because they were born into a nation who didn't know who God was? No, this is, Exodus wasn't, it was a cosmology. It was Yahweh saying, hey, wait a minute. Because Exodus, as you'll see, had their own creation story. Or Talmud and Metu, or whoever it is. Metu, that's a good one. <laughs> they separated the waters from the waters, and then they made the heavens and the earth. Well, that sounds just like the Bible. Yeah. So atheists will go, see, that predates the Bible. The Bible must not be true. No, this was Yahweh clarifying who made what. That's good. Right? I've already said this, right? Didn't we already go through this? This is God clarifying who made what, not these two dinglebats who used to be on my divine council who have now fallen because they want worship to themselves and don't want to redirect worship to me. Now I'm going to stand in their midst and reveal that I'm the one true God, not these two knuckleheads, right? And how does he prove that he's the one who separated the waters from the waters? What's the biggest part of the Exodus story? Mm -hmm. right, the dividing of the Red Sea. The dividing of the Red Sea. I think you saw the videos. If you haven't gotten there yet, we watched the videos. Um, that you can go right there where they went across the Red Sea. Amazing. Yeah, it's it's so the cool. shallowest part of the Gulf of Aqaba. Guess what's on the bottom? Chariot wheels. Chariot wheels. Guess what's on the other side of it? The pillar erected by King Solomon that says, this is where the Israelites cross. Guess what's about 40 miles away? A mountain where the top of it's burnt because that's where the glory came down. A rock that's split it's in two. Amazing. A big golden calf. An encampment that held about two million people. It's all just sitting right there. Mm -hmm. yeah. The golden calf. And it's protected, right? The, the altar. Oh. The golden calf is yeah, gone. The altar's there. And underneath the altar, they have drawings of golden calves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's called the real, the real Mount Sinai. Oh, sorry. We'll get into more of that later. I'm tangenting. This, I'm wetting your appetite for more. It's coming, and the proof is in the pudding. And now that word's out that that's there, you get. I mean, you can go Google it. I mean, I've got the actual videos and Old Testament studies that we'll watch when you guys all do second year. But you can actually go there and see it all. Yeah. Right? It's all right there. So if you Google it, you'll see the real Mount Sinai. The top third of the thing, you'll see a cave in the side of the mountain. This is called Elijah's cave. It's also the same place that Moses hid in the cleft of the rock. From, when Yahweh passed by, right? It's all right there. That's uh, there's another channel called Expedition Bible on YouTube, and he goes to every single place where the Bible says the story happened, and it's not even protected. Like the things in the, it's just laying on the ground, right there, wide well, open. Which one is protected? With the yeah, there's there's a couple of them. There's a couple of them with fences around. He kind of has to sneak in, so it depends. Like the place in Saudi Arabia, you can't technically go there unless you have permission by the government. Yeah. Um, there's like uh, where Jacob's ladder is is kind of cut off, and some of these things. I've got a video in. I think it's in here. You guys will see. I talk all about um, 
what the stairway to heaven actually is. It's part of the ziggurat tower. The ziggurat tower is what the Tower of Babylon was. The Tower of Babylon, the footprint is still there in Babylon. You can see it. You just can't see the tower. But you can see the ziggurat of Ur to give you a picture of what it looks like. It was an attempt to, it was a pyramid shaped structure, which was an attempt to recreate Eden. That's why you have pyramids all over the planet and ancient worlds because civilizations all over the world after the fall of Babel were all trying to climb their way back into heaven, but that was missing the point because heaven was always coming to earth in a man named Jesus. You have to build something. Jesus said, I will be the builder. You don't have to form something. I'm forming and I'm going to fill it with my presence. Just like the temple was formed and then filled with the presence. Why do you think it says we're the new temple? Because that was just a shadow of who we've always been. So cool. But he did something external so we could visualize what he does inside of us when he changes us from the inside out. It's not about behavior or working your way in. He was hung outside the camp as the invitation. Right? No tangenting. Hey, baby. She's back there pinching her. <laughs> so what if... What if the Exodus was an attempt to actually bring salvation to Egypt? And they, they chose to worship their own gods and half, half the army ended up drowning under the weight. Right? You know, what if the whole blood was offered to everyone and it was right there freely and they could have easily have copied what the Israelites were doing, but they didn't. Well, if that whole thing was about saving two nations, not just one. These are so when you say well, that's that's good exegesis, that's a good question and observation, right? But if you take that one story here, right? Like Tamaki said, right? Oh wait, and then you try to build God's character. Here's who God is. You build a house and call that God based on that one story. Then you're not going to come up with a pure image. You're going to come up with a distortion. Yeah. And then someone 2,000 years and from the future looks at this and not at this and misunderstands that and then puts this image on top of Jesus. It mm -hmm. says that Jesus demands what was demanded here. And then we try to reproduce that by telling everyone everywhere they're all going to hell and going. We're judging. Good. Instead of redeeming. It's all part of the big picture. The whole, whole reason he came was to remove this false image yes. of separation that emerged yes. when they chose good and evil thinking over relational thinking. Mm -hmm. When they chose transactional thinking over being. Yeah. See how all this is coming together? Mm -hmm. Right? So this is why someone had to come along and write a book called How Not to Read the Bible because... The atheists are misunderstanding it, or they're not, and they have an agenda mm -hmm. to disprove God, yeah. right? Because it's hard to be a professor in a college and not have taken some type of religious class that gives you some type of introduction for how to read the Bible. Mm -hmm. I had a friend, we called him K-Pec, because we worked out at the gym, his, his pecs were so huge, we, it's called, we said he'd like to do the, the skateboard ramp up in between them. But I always talk to him about God. I guess that was unnecessary information. So we always talk about God. He goes to school, comes back after like a month of philosophy class. I don't believe in any of that anymore. They just completely destroyed his face in one philosophy class. At least he went to philosophy class, same thing. I, Emmanuel Kant is the father of modern philosophy. He's got a lot of great stuff. He coined the term Weltanschauung, which is a worldview. Right? That's how we view God ourselves in the world. He didn't coin it that way. He coined it differently. But since then, philosophy's kind of been built on that. But Immanuel Kant thought sex was gross and the emotions were bad. And if all philosophy kind of goes back to him as the origin point, hmm, mm -hmm. a lot of philosophy teachers are probably identifying with that because they're missing love that fills those places that Kant didn't have filled. Right? I tried to figure out everything, but I guess he just can't do it. <laughs> Man, that was dumb. So there's a couple of stories. There's one story about a professor who for years would teach his entire class and go, does anyone still believe in God? And some people did, but they were, they were just too afraid to answer him. 
right? And he goes, exactly, because if God was real, when I dropped this piece of chalk, it wouldn't break. And he'd open his hand, drop it, and it would shatter. And one young man heard about this, and he thought, the whole semester, I'm, I'm going to stand up. I'm going to be the first one who stands up and says, yes, I still believe in God. So go through all of the class the whole semester. And he goes, all right, does anyone still believe in God? And the young man stands up and says, I still believe in God. He goes, you fool. If there was a guy, I'm going to drop this piece of chalk. And it rolled down his arm, down his elbow, off his shoe, and rolled across the floor. It didn't break. <laughs> the whole class erupted in like praise, going, yeah. And the professor ran out of the, ran out of the room. Right? That's awesome. But yeah. you see, that here's the whole point. You see people growing up in church, and then no one in church has ever addressed some of these things. And they may have addressed some of these things, but no one's ever said, well, what does this reveal to you about the nature of God? You serve a God like this? Yeah. <laughs> right? There's a passage where, I can do this in nine minutes, for a bend time. There's a passage in one of the Psalms, and it says, um, I think it's in here somewhere, you'll read it. It says you grab the infant or the kid by the, by the uh, heels and struck the kid against the tree until repeatedly until they die. It says, do you serve a God like that who would do that? And people are like, no, no, I don't want to serve that. They even did a trick. They said, do you think this came from the Bible or the Quran? And people are like, no, I, I absolutely it must have come from the Quran. They're like, nope, it came from the Bible. Well, how do you make sense of a passage like that? What was that? Again, we're looking at one slice, one half of a slice of a psalm that was written by one of the survivors of the exile to Babylon. When they exiled people to Babylon, they ran all the kids, 14 and under, who couldn't make the journey, they ran them all through with a spear. So they killed the whole generation. So the person who was writing this psalm was lamenting about how that made him feel towards his enemies in that moment. So what was that? That was a human processing emotions. That wasn't God directing and guiding. So if you don't know how to understand something that's written like that, you'll attribute something to God, which was another part of the fallen creation, which reveals the need for a savior, which is part of God's plan mm -hmm. for eternal family. <laughs> but if you take that one little thing out and then reject it onto who you think God is, you come up with a God that looks like that, but not a God that looks like Jesus. Right? Are we tracking? Where's the mic, Where's the mic again? So what if the exit of the story was God's attempt to save Egypt from their false gods to come out of slavery? Instead of being participates, participants with grace offered to Israel, they participated with the judgment being released against their gods. Right? So he continued to introduce the book's themes, right, as we go. Um learning how not to read the Bible. Let me see what's on page nine. I'm just gonna go through my highlights here and I'll end it. You guys doing all right? Yes. No Christian should be afraid of difficult questions. I don't have an answer for every crazy sounding thing in the Bible, right? I had to do some research this afternoon because of a verse I read this morning. I'm like, hmm. <laughs> that verse is challenging. Oh, oh let's, let's do this. <laughs> right? Let's see. Let's see where we go from here. The good news, this is verse 9, is that there are responses to those bizarre Bible verses and difficult questions. You can be thinking intelligent Christian and 100% and, and believe in the trustworthy, in trustworthiness and inspiration of the Bible. Yes, these, yet these verses seem difficult to comprehend. Uh, however, I've learned that when we apply certain study methods and examine verses in their context, it can change how we view and read the Bible, and that's what the whole book's about, right? I just want to say that so we all make sure we understand what we're reading and why we're reading it. Page 15, he's trying to... So here's, here's one little caveat for the whole thing. Um... He really presents this on a level that is applied to his audience, which is people who don't know that much about the Bible, uh, young people coming out of high school, going into college. He's writing it to give them an arsenal. If they walk in there with a supernatural worldview and talk, start talking about 
you know, seeing the spirit, angels and demons, demons and supernatural signs and wonders and stuff like that, then that's a whole nother argument, right? So that's, he's not really addressing that here. So as we're reading this Bible, we're still reading it through a kingdom lens of the fact that God still moves in signs, wonders, and miracles, and awesome stuff today, right? Um, I can tell you story after story of even some people in this room experiencing, like, the entire building shaking, mm -hmm. right? I'm not going to go there. We'll go there later. Reel it in. Reel it in. We had an encounter a couple of years ago at one of our previous locations reel that was in. bonkers. I was really in. <laughs> so I'm trying to get through my con now. <laughs> Several years ago, I'm teaching in Bethlehem. I'm talking about revival history. It's awesome. It's amazing. I'm talking about all these different people who are doing science, wonders, and miracles, healing the sick, raising the dead, seeing signs in the heavens and the earth, right? Seeing all this stuff. I'm talking about it, and the room has about 100 people in it. And pretend like you're 100 people. And there's a guy over here on the front row. I said, heaven's throwing a touchdown pass to the earth right now. One of you are going to catch it. My friend Travis leans back in his chair, starts vibrating. He gets electrocuted. He floats, he floats up three feet in the air. He levitates, he goes five feet sideways, and then he hits the ground right in front of the whole class. Yeah, I was doing the same thing. I was like, he caught it. <laughs> so some people jump up, some people start wailing, some people start freaking out, the whole class goes crazy. Some people are like, I didn't see it, what just happened? You know? Our friend Jan, who you'll see here in a minute, she starts arm crawling. She was the first year director, and I held the mic up. I thought, well, if she makes it, I'll give her the mic. She never made it, so I kept the mic. Uh, <laughs> Because you honor the leader in the room. She was doing her best to get up. I was like, what were you doing? Were you trying to come get the mic? She's like, no, I just want to get closer to the glory. That's right. So it was crazy. So I'm telling the story. Whoa. I told you that Pillsbury no, no Dave. I'm telling the story in first year a couple of years ago. It's Kelly's first night. Yeah. Kelly had no grade for any of this stuff. She comes in the room. And we derail from the agenda. We start talking about how God moves and miracles, <laughs> signs and wonders, and power. <laughs> seen it. I've seen it. I've seen the room light up. I've seen the building shake. I've been, it, it rained, rained on. It went to the far end of the. See, once he starts moving, the filter comes off. I've been to the far end of the universe. I'm not kidding. No, no, they found me. I mean, they hear a TikTok video about me, but it's okay. I'm not going to stop, right? And so we're talking about this, and I said, right when I got to the point where I said, and, and, and Travis levitated out of his chair, we're all sitting there, a chair in the room floats up into the air by itself. Right? And I didn't see it, because I'm doing the theatrical stuff I'm doing now, because I'm getting passionate. And all of a sudden I look, and the chair goes like this. I said, did that chair just float? <laughs> and they're like, yeah. And one of the guys in the room who wasn't quite be the one you would pick out to be the one who like jumps right into the supernatural. He's like, yeah, my arm went up and actually held it down. He's going to go, So what was the point in that? Right? The point in that was this. I'm talking about something that sounds crazy. And as I'm talking about it, God comes and does a similar miracle. Because he's not bound by time, space, or matter, or any of the any of the other forms that you put for us to experience resistance. His whole point in forming something in the natural was to fill it with the supernatural. That is the embodiment of Jesus. That's mm -hmm. who he is. Yeah. And when we can begin to have a grid and see it and read the Bible through that lens, we'll shake the earth. Right? We'll begin to rule and reign in our identity as daughters and sons. Knowing who we are. Knowing that death has already been defeated and lost its power. We're all to reign. That's right. Right? Mm -hmm. It's about a little what fresh wave of glory come into this room even now. Holy Spirit, begin to move and breathe on us. In a brand new way tonight, God. Let your fire come. Let your glory come. Wow.
There you go. Thanks, guy. Get some of that. So we keep in mind when we're reading this book that um, you read it through that lens. That's the lens you're reading it through. Because like things like unicorns, they may have existed. But you say that to a modern audience, no, there's just no way. Dinosaurs, they're all over ancient literature. They're called Leviathan and dragons and different things, right? So you see a period in humanity where all of this is overlapped. So don't get overly scientific or lost by what he's saying. Keep the supernatural in mind because he downplays it a little bit. That's all I'm saying. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And I'll talk about dinosaurs and unicorns and stuff later and stuff like that. But um, I know we're just in the glory and now I'm rambling. It's like, what we, do? <laughs> we got some cool stuff coming up. And I want to honor my wife because we do have an encounter, actually a couple encounters planned for tonight. So what is this? This is a moose bouche. A moose bouche. Yes. What is that? It's a bite-sized hors d'oeuvre. That's right. As we're getting our spirits ready to go even deeper here in a couple of minutes. Hey, if you want to go ahead and ascend, it's fine with me. Just, you know, some of you are already half gone anyways. And just keep going. Don't let me stop you. Right? But read the, read the book through balance. You know, he partners more with logic and reason in his many of his arguments rather than the supernatural. But that's okay because that was his audience, right? Boom, boom, boom. You guys read the first two parts. I did. Don't. And I comprehended it. Good. <laughs> that's right. But don't just write off every crazy sounding verse with a logical explanation. It may indeed be supernatural. Uh, there's this thing called recency bias. It's where what we, we believe that what we know today is more important or smarter than what they knew back then. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when we do it, we're like, well, they didn't know that they were seeing this. They thought they were seeing that. And they reinterpret the Bible based on our generation. Well, every generation does that. So which generation is right? The one in which it was written. Mm -hmm. you go there, then you make the right application at the right time for the hour you've been given. It's being recorded. The right generation is the one that was written to in their time. That helps you make the right interpretation for the hour that you've been given. Mm -hmm. That's good. Um, uh, chapter 2 the, was all about how the Bible is not written to us, but for us. For us. For us right? Um, so I'm going to skip some of this. You guys read it. It's really good stuff. Uh, he gives a background for the Bible. There's 39 Old Testament books, 27 new, which comes out to a grand total of 66. 66 for most of our modern Bibles. Now, like the Catholic Bible and Orthodox Bibles have the dual, the dual canonical books or the Apocrypha added to them as well. We'll talk more about that stuff in the second year. Kristen knows all about it. She's been studying it. I wouldn't go that far, but I have an understanding. Yes, you're getting there. Puff the magic <laughs> dragon who lives by the sea. Oh, I this was funny. Who's heard that that song was all about drugs? Yeah. <coughs> and what we discover? That it's not. It has nothing to do with it. That song was written in 1959. When did the counterculture revolution start? 70s. 1969. 69. That's a 10-year gap, right? When did Lord of the Rings come out? 1949, oh, really? 29 to 49. So, so think about think about something in the context of what came before it, not what came after. What came before a song about magical dragons living by the sea? Oh, the first epic fantasy to ever be released. So, what was probably influencing the author? Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings. Not drug culture that wouldn't happen for ten more years. But people read it past that, and they start us using language like. I'm going to take a puff and in the place where I buy my weed and from Hawaii. And then they look back at that and they say, oh, this must be what that means when I had nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. That's good. This was written at a certain time that came with what came before. That means it was connected to the narrative before it. But then in our generation, we try to look back at it and say, this is what this must mean based on our understanding today. It's the same exact thing. We get laser guided missiles. 
Correct. That, so, <laughs> so now you see how well-meaning people can misunderstand it the same way they did a, a children's song yeah. and tried to make it about drug culture, and it ruined the song mm -hmm. because they misinterpreted it, wow. right? Um, so he goes through, you know, you got the, on 44, you got the chart of the six acts, and he's going to repeat that, so, because we're low on time, uh, he'll repeat that throughout the book, and he'll show you where you're at in the, in the different acts, and that ties into the storyline of the Bible that Tim Mackey was talking about as well. He kind of broke it down less, uh, Dan Kimball's breaking it down more, but that's a good, it's a good visualization when we can see it on paper. Not just reading columns, but see it. Oh, there's a graph that helps me explain it better. Yeah. And then we see, watch the Bible project that's hitting it in three different ways. Right. You're seeing it and you're repeating it, but you're repeating it in different types of communication that helps you absorb it differently, right? All right. And he repeats some of the things we learned in how not how to read the Bible. We're not we're not under Israeli judicial or civil laws that wasn't for us that was for a different time and people who needed a savior yeah mm -hmm. we have a savior we have one. Mm -hmm. yes we do so. they needed one we have one yeah. but much of the church still acts like we need one yeah yeah, yeah that's true. we already have one mm -hmm. how can that change our thinking and outlook towards the bible ourselves mm -hmm. others and humanity yeah we have a savior yeah, yeah. yeah. right so i should sound like the savior has come i shouldn't sound like we need a savior the old way has already been washed away, judged, and torn down, and the new way has already been inaugurated. That's why Paul says, don't resurrect the old man. Paul was writing to Jews who were misunderstanding this. They were called Judaizers. They were trying to mix the law and the new covenant. He's like, no, we couldn't even, we've been trying to do this our whole life, and we couldn't. Why would you put this on the Gentiles? This is pointless. That's not what Christ came, Christ came and did it all on your behalf and said, it is finished. Right? Right, so he's setting us up, you know. Like they even have Tim Tebow in here. He's praying that he's touching the pigskin. Oh, I mean, that's just so stupid, right? That's just dumb. Well, he's insane. He's praying, but now he's touching the pigskin. It says, doesn't, don't touch a pigskin. The whole point of that, again, remember, was to <clears throat> distinguish between Yahweh and the lesser gods. And what they were doing. That's why the laws are so weird, right? And he gave several examples of weird laws. Like in one state, you can't put ice cream in your pocket. It's illegal to put ice cream in your pocket. Well, why? Well, somebody probably did some weird, strange thing with ice cream in their pocket. <laughs> you know so, what? Total Twins has a whole thing on, ever on the, 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 well, well, all the states that have ridiculous things and what, what they're for. There's still ridiculous stuff. In one state, you can still beat your wife as long as the stick isn't more than an inch wide. Ridiculous. Rule of thumb. I mean, it's insane. It's insane. Right? Don't worry, ladies. We're liberating you. It's going to get great. When you watch some of these videos this week, you're going to be like, yeah. <laughs> Because God said he didn't need a helper. He, the word there is help meet. Yeah. It's co-equal. Can you say that you use help mate? It's not help mate, it's help meet in Hebrew. It's co-equal, right? So he, 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 rib meant side. It didn't mean like, you know, a rib from the, from the barbecue joint. <laughs> so rib in Hebrew meant side. And so what does he do? One becomes two, right? Now, now man has a role and woman has a role, right? Mm -hmm. Men are giving and women are receiving. And that's the nature of it, right? That's why the dynamics between men and women look different. Man, have a, man has a role to protect and do all these different things. Women have a role to nurture, and you see that in the Godhead. Holy Spirit in Hebrew is feminine. In the New Testament, it's neutral. English translators had a hard time with that, so they made Holy Spirit masculine. the Pillsbury <laughs> Doe Irina. <laughs> Pillsbury Doe Irina. 
So I'm not saying God's a woman. I'm saying that within God, all aspects of humanity are present. When God said, let us make man in our own image, male and female, he created them. He started with Adam, right? Because Eve was within Adam. And Adam, that almost represents the splitting of a cell. So tell, the cells will come back together and what we pro, and procreate. All right, which is the pattern of creation. I'm tangenting. There's a lot of good stuff in this book. I didn't get through all my notes, but I'm going to stop here. Right? Yes. Um, yeah. Hey, just keep tracking with Holy Spirit.